Good evening and welcome to The Square. Tonight's discussion is going to focus on climate change. Uh, the key questions we'll be asking ourselves are the causes, the consequences, as well as the solutions. We're going to have a look uh, at some of the interventions Rwanda has done as a country and also, also globally in terms of contributing to the fight um, against climate change. With us tonight, we have two guests, uh, and I'll start with our guest, who is the country representative of Green Growth Institute Rwanda, Inghi Chang. Welcome to The Square. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure Welcome to, be here. to the square. Pleasure to be here. Great. We also have with us uh, Juliet Cabrera, who is the Director General of the Rwanda Environmental Management Authority. Uh, Juliet, welcome to the square. Thank you for hosting me. Great. My name is Denon Pisi, host of the square, and I'm joined with the resident panelists of the square as always. Charles Hubbard, great to have you on the show. Samir Dan, how are you? Good. Good. Also joined by Brenna Namata, great to have you on the show as always. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as we always do before we kick off, uh, you know we have midweek highlights that we'd like to touch on. Uh, just very briefly, uh, Brenna, I'll start with you. Is there anything that caught your attention this week that you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, there's so much happening. <laughs> yeah. Um, but finally, we have the economic recovery plan. Uh, it will be good to get more information, break it down for the beneficiaries. Yeah. Great. I think that's even a topic we can probably have uh, next week on the square. Yeah. Uh, Charles, any midweek highlights you'd like to share with us? Yeah, of course, um, it's very unfortunate that uh, the Burundian president passed on, um, Pierre Nkurunziza. Uh, now more than ever, the Burundians need prayers. You know, at the height of the coronavirus, when every country was taking precautions, the late Nkurunziza said, we have prayed, and God will hear our prayers, and we will be fine. Unfortunately, may his soul rest in peace. President Murunziza passes on. His wife is not doing great, and unreliable reports I picked on social media say the rest of the family and uh, a few close people in the leadership have also been uh, affected. Now, why I'm saying now more than ever they, do they need prayers is we do hope that they don't slump into a further uh, sort of a political instability. crisis and instability because uh, usually when a leader passes on, especially in a country that is already known for being, uh, um, for having problems and they have a, so many of the people who have been forced out of the country, the huge leadership gap and leadership challenges they've been having back home, it's more likely to, 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 to go back to, into chaotic times. So we do pray for the Burundi and the Burundian people and President Moroz's uh, soul to rest in peace. And, yeah. Brenna, is there something you wanted to add? I just wanted to comment on, on, on his observation. Yes. Um, I, I think it will take more than prayers mm -hmm. uh, for, <laughs> for Burundi. Um, I hope we'll see uh, proactive steps from the region and the African Union um, in the interest of stability within the Great Lakes. Uh, because for the last uh, couple of years, um, there's not so much that has happened in terms of, uh, of the regional approach. It hasn't worked. Uh, but going forward, we hope that everybody's tired of the stalemate in, uh, in Burundi. And it's an opportunity to kind of, you know, engage and be proactive and find a way of... Um, helping the Burian people to, to get some bit of you know, peace and stability. And move forward. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much, Charles and Brenna. As always, uh, you know, those are the midweek highlights we'd like to capture before we kick off the show. Uh, but here tonight, we are here to discuss uh, understanding climate change uh, and its effects uh, in Rwanda, as well as, as also on a global scale. Uh, and if I could start by addressing this question to our guests, um, starting with um, Director General of REMA, Juliet Cabrera. If you could just share with us, uh, before we really delve into the uh, conversation tonight, um, you know, just generally, what are the, uh, the causes and consequences uh, of climate change globally, uh, specifically including its effects in Rwanda. Thank you, Diana. Um, climate change, I think, has been a subject of discussion globally for some years now, since the mid-20th century. And uh, this simply means uh, increase in global temperature uh, for some good uh, number of years consistently. Uh, so uh, from our elementary science, I think we remember that uh, oh, oh, the, the natural source of, uh, of heat
heat is all got from the sun and uh, the earth in its natural um, status, in its natural equilibrium, is able to actually absorb enough heat for us to have life on earth and reflect back what we don't need. Uh, unfortunately, because of uh, you know, increase in population and uh, increase of emissions into the atmosphere, this balance is destabilized and we end up having more uh, of the gases in the atmosphere that uh, end up uh, ma not making it easy for the earth to radiate that temperature and it stays here with us uh, for such a long time that we end up having a, a global temperature rise. Uh, so uh, if I can try to paint a picture here, we, we again, from our elementary science, I know a lot of publications have been done, but let's keep it simple this evening. Uh, we, we all remember we have gases like oxygen, like you know, nitrogen, like uh, carbon dioxide in the air, naturally. Uh, but, and these are really good enough uh, to capture the heat that I was talking about. Um, so much so that we, uh, if it wasn't for those gases, we would have uh, the Earth's temperature, average temperature, at around negative 18 degrees, and that would be unbearable. That would, wouldn't be um, good for, the, uh, for life on Earth. But because of them, we are able to have a, you know, an average global temperature of around 15% degrees, and that is just perfect for life on Earth. Uh, so because of industrialization and uh, burning of fossil fuels for industries, for, for cars, for transportation, for different sectors. Uh, we're seeing um, more of these gases come into the atmosphere, much as they were already naturally there, but we tend to add more into the atmosphere, and uh, you know that um, leads to the warming of the globe. We also have other artificially made um, greenhouse gases, but I'll save you the, the very long names. But these all come to make the world, the, the earth, lose its ability to, you know, have the, the temperature in equilibrium. Um, so uh, it, globally, I think we are seeing this happening, but also here back home, we are seeing this happening as well. Um, the climate data that we have uh, shows that uh, from 1971, 1970, up to 2005, we registered a, a, a temperature rise of, uh, an average temperature rise of 1.2 degrees centigrade. And this is already above the global temperature rise, which uh, in that period was found to be around 0 0.9 degrees centigrade. So the consequences are what we have been seeing. Because of increased temperature, uh, obviously means we are going to have more evaporation, uh, we are going to have more uh, precipitation, and uh, in visible terms means we are going to see longer dry spells, or we are going to see uh, more heavy rains, floods, intensity of the rains increasing, having too much rains, you know, very irregular change of seasons, and this again has a uh, affects different economic activities like agriculture and so on and so forth. So, um, in a nutshell, that's, that's what I would uh, try to illustrate climate change as, and uh, the causes being human activities, but also uh, having population growth as a, a huge driver, because the more people we are on the earth, the more, you know, we, we encroach on the the earth is natural systems, deforestation and uh, clearing of vegetation, which would otherwise be the sink of these emissions that we generate is all um, reduced and uh, these emissions have nowhere to go other than staying mm. in the atmosphere for that long. Of course. Uh, thank you for that uh, brief overview and uh, definitely we're going to get back into, you know, what you mentioned, the increased landslides, the increased dry spells, irregular, irregular um, rainfall in Rwanda that has really um, devastated a, a lot of communities over the last couple of years. Inki, I would like to ask if you have anything to add to what um, uh, Deje from Rema, Juliet Cabrera has said regarding climate change, its causes uh, uh, and, and consequences. Thank you, Diana. Um, I think DG mentioned uh, very well the, the science 
um, and the, the concept behind climate change. Uh, of course, it's mainly the temperature rise uh, in the globe due to human activities, and we say that's uh, man-made or anthropogenic activities. I think due to the, uh, this temperature rise, obviously there are a lot of um, impacts. Of course, sea level rise, um, iceberg melting, etc., is one of them. But just back, uh, back here in Rwanda, as a landlocked country, uh, as Digi mentioned, um, due to climate change, there's a lot of precipitation, a lot of heavy rainfall uh, that's now giving rise to flooding and landslide risks, etc. So there's a lot of negative impacts that's, that's uh, associated with climate change that we need to really address. And that has direct impact on the livelihoods of, of the community, of the people. Um, so I think more than positive, there has been more negative impact, and that's why we are, I think, here to discuss about the, the solutions and what we need to do to mitigate and, and adapt ourselves to climate change. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Charles Brenner, would you like to weigh in uh, just very quickly before we go to the next part of the conversations regarding what uh, our guests have just shared with us? Um, I'm not sure I have so much, though. I think it's <laughs> more of a learning curve, especially when... Uh, Juliet and Inhi, I hope I got the pronunciation right. Yes, I think you did. Uh, yes. yes. Um, it's, uh, I, 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 let me listen for the time being. Yes. <laughs> Brenna, is there something you'd like to add? Um, just to kind of break it down further for ordinary people who are not scientists, uh, because sometimes... And, and me too. <laughs> <laughs> the, the language uh, around climate change gets very scientific, which is good because we have some powerful person who doesn't believe in science. So the scientists <laughs> have to amplify their voices. Uh, but I think for, for, for the common person to understand uh, what climate change is, it's really to look at what is happening around them. Um, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, we saw uh, the landslides, you know, that we lost so many lives, <laughs> uh, a lot of flooding. Uh, we've seen now, again, extreme temperatures. One day it's, uh, it's very cold, then the next day it's extremely hot. So in a nutshell, when we talk about climate change, these are the extremes uh, that we, we, we are talking about. And Rwanda, I think, has its own unique problems. One, uh, being densely populated. Um, so you find there's a lot of pressure. One, because of uh, agriculture. Uh, mm. The biggest part of our population continues to depend on agriculture, so there's a lot of pressure. Then, again, soil erosion um, is also a big issue. Um, then you'll see that uh, inhabitants, because of, you know, competing to be in the same space, again, that causes pressure. And as a result, you'll find that uh, we are not doing as much conservation, for instance, that we have seen um, with biodiversity. You know, there's a lot of efforts, uh, and over the last years, I think the government has really focused on tourism, for instance. That's quite prominent. We are yet to see that effort when it comes to agriculture, for instance, in terms of soil uh, conservation. So there's a lot of pressure. So just in a nutshell, I think yeah. that's what I would say. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I like that you mentioned um, the way it's affecting communities. And uh, if you could tell us, um, uh, back to, I guess, very quickly, we know that African uh, countries... Uh, especially more recently, have been, uh, you know, are largely dependent on agriculture to grow their economies. Uh, but we've seen waves of catastrophes, um, you know, whether it's serious drought, whether it's swarms of uh, locusts and so forth and so on. Can you just give us an idea of actual examples, you know, for, for not only us here to understand, but also for our audiences, especially for African uh, countries who really depend on agriculture for growing their economies, what are some actual examples of climate change that uh, have affected these countries? Uh, and I'll start with you, uh, Inghi, mm -hmm. since you, you spoke last. Uh, if you could give us some examples on this. Sure. Um, I think the one that um, comes to my mind is Mozambique, where there was a flooding and cyclone recently. I think it was in March last year. Um, so that has devastated the country and has washed out all the agricultural products um, hence, you know, food security it became a huge issue. Um, and also, you mentioned locust, uh, locust swarms, but uh, the, the Horn of Africa has been greatly impacted by 
these uh, swarm of uh, locusts, and, uh, and it's partly due to climate change because this climate disruption, the rise in temperatures, more wet days have actually helped them to reproduce much more, and this swarm uh, of locusts have really uh, infested the, the Horn of Africa, and that, that, that has had a very big impact on, on food production and food security in, in the eastern African region. Um, and also close to home in Rwanda, uh, I believe that uh, the flooding has also uh, wiped, uh, wiped out uh, a large portions of rice fields in the southern province. Um, so that has also uh, given rise to um, increasing food prices, and which has impacted the vulnerable groups and the low-income households more than, uh, than any other uh, social group. So there's a lot of uh, real examples close to home and at home uh, because of uh, climate change that's affecting negatively on agriculture. Uh, Juliet, would you like to add on that? Yeah, um, just to compliment in here, um, the, the country that comes in my mind in Africa is Sahel. The Sahel region is already um, water stressed and uh, in this, uh, you know, the, because of the climate change, it's becoming actually more and more drier. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of uh, uh, in my migrations and uh, people migrating um, partly because they, they, cannot, they can't get any yield from their land. And uh, one wonders where does climate change uh, stop? And where does, well, how do we treat it as a, as a security issue? Because if you're looking at people migrating from one area to the other, at some point from one continent to the other, then I think we had better looked at it from a, a wider angle than we are looking at it right now. Uh, yeah, I was, I was expecting Juliet to talk about Rwanda. Because I think um, we also need to be a bit concerned about uh, the rapid rate of urbanization. And um, maybe uh, it would be very interesting to know INIS or especially in a global growth initiative are active in, in that space. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at, for example, uh, the rate of urbanization, and I'll just talk about infrastructure and housing. And you look at the speed with which uh, we are building, especially Kigali city and the urban cities, and the demand and pressure for, for housing and infrastructure. Um, a lot of it which is at the expense of uh, what we call soft landscaping, which would be grass and other green areas on which water can land and run off to as compared to roads. So these days we all want tarmac roads, we all want cycling lanes, we all want paved walkways for the pedestrians. You know, and, and, and what's the price we're paying for that? You know, motors are off the streets. You'd imagine, I'd imagine Juliet and Ini were celebrating for the several weeks when motors were off the streets mm -hmm. because we were breathing cleaner air probably. But then, you know, they, 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 they come back on and uh, the emissions are all of a sudden up there. And we have 34,000 or 345,000 houses to build in Kigali, in the same Kigali that has not grown much bigger. You know, what does that mean for us? So, so I was really hoping, I, I, um, unless they're saying that Rwanda is better off compared to the Sahel region, and I think <laughs> Mozambique that, that Ine talked about, but uh, I'm worried about Rwanda as well. Uh, you, so you have a reason. Yes. You, you have a great reason to be worried about Rwanda. Uh, at least in the last rainy season, uh, we, we, we got to see what uh, the impacts of climate change are. Uh, unfortunately, this was so bad that uh, it ended up, uh, we ended up losing so many lives. Over 243 people died uh, from January to, 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 to May. And this was so sad. Uh, we're talking about lives, but we also lost a lot of uh, infrastructure, classrooms, uh, people's homes were lost. And Charles, you put it so uh, eloquently that uh, this uh, is coming as a consequence of the kind of, uh, you know, the land use change, the urbanization that we are working so hard to reach at. But how do we reach there is, is, a good, is, a, is the big question. Can we have both? Fortunately, yes. We can have the urbanization and we can have um, climate-proof urbanization. Mm. Depending on how we do the planning, where, uh, where we do the different activities at, 
uh, I think we should be concerned uh, by the way we are, the, the development costs that we are, um, you know, working so hard to get, how to develop in a sense that is resilient. I think that's the terminology we um, use in my, in my area of, uh, you know, uh, resilient to climate change. Literally uh, being able to cope with the changing climate because unfortunately climate change is here with us. We are not going to, you know, to get rid of it tomorrow. Yes, we can work at that, but for this part of the world and Rwanda as home, we don't have an option, but we have to, you know, make sure that the economic development is done in a way that is climate proof. Uh, studies have, have, have been made. I think uh, you might have looked at a, a study by Sir Nicholas Stan. I think he, he's talking so much about the economics of, uh, of climate change. And uh, uh, the science is out there, the, economist, the economics is all there, and it shows uh, the cost of inaction. If we don't act, we are definitely going to have a, a big portion of our GDP lost to this. Matter of fact, I think in East Africa, there was a study that was uh, conducted and showed that in East Africa, our GDP uh, is going to be lost, 1% of our GDP is going to be lost if we don't uh, climate proof the kind of development that we are um, working on. I, I, like, I like the way you said uh, climate proof our, our development because one goes in hand uh, with the other, Juliet. Um, if we can just move quickly to, unless you want to add something, Brenna, or? Yeah. Okay, uh, if we can move to now um, actual international frameworks that Rwanda is party to. Uh, and we know um, recently, I think a week, over a week ago, uh, Rwanda was the first country um, to sub submit its new action, uh, climate action plan. Uh, this is what is known as an NDC, a National um, Determined Com Contribution to the Paris Agreement. Uh, and this action plan is worth um, 11 billion dollars uh, to be implemented over a period until 2030. Um, you know, these are big numbers, these are, this is big news, first African country to do it, uh, mm -hmm. and even we talk of going even uh, more uh, above its target, uh, uh, connecting to the Paris Agreement. If you could share with us, uh, and Inghi, I'll start with you, what does this mean? What does this mean for Rwandans, um, this huge figure, what is the implementation aspect of this, uh, and how does, uh, you know, the Green Growth uh, Global Institute work with various stakeholders in Rwanda, such as REMA, to make this, uh, meeting this target happen? Sure. Um, so 11 billion um, US dollars is a, is a large sum of money, and those kind of money will be channeled to uh, mitigating climate impact, uh, as well as uh, adapting to climate impact. So what that means, uh, not just for Rwanda, but you know, for, for people um, around the globe and in the region is that there'll be resources, there'll be funding uh, that will be channeled towards low carbon, climate resilient um, projects and interventions. So we have to now move away from fossil fuel and carbon intensive ways of development because the funding and the money and the resources will not go to that type of activities. So that's, what, that's, I think, in a nutshell what it really means. At the same time, you know, there are a lot of actors and players in this, in, this, in this field, and there needs to be a coordinated and concerted effort. And I think it's great that uh, Rwanda is one of the very few countries, and I think first in Africa, to submit the revised NDC, a very commendable um, uh, milestone, uh, if I may add. Uh, so it, it really sets out the roadmap for different sectors to really achieve climate action how do you mitigate climate change and also adapt to a climate, uh, climate uh, resilience, uh, improve climate resilience, rather. So, um, so they, these are some of the roadmap that now is there, and we now need to have a, a concerted and coordinated effort to, to make that happen. So there's two things in a nutshell. One, there will be funding available, resources available to mitigate climate change and adapt to climate change going forward. And two, we need to now work together, uh, together development partners, government, a community alike, to really um, implement the roadmap that's set out in the NDC. Juliet? Can I? Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, before Juliet says something, Charles, did you want to say something? Yeah, and uh, I just wanted to comment further about what Ini said around uh, the coordination that's required. And I'll, I'll talk about it from a point that, uh, the point that Juliet raised earlier on around, um, I think I interpreted it as 
greening the urbanization uh, mm. journey, I'll put it that way, sorry to... Gre greening our development. Greening our development, yes. yes. Um, I, I think uh, we, we can take a few more steps around uh, coordinating mm. our organs. You see, uh, globally there are the certification like age or lead and there's a certification that is given for projects mm -hmm. maybe in residential commercial whatever and you know the IFC will say it's, they have their own standards and the World Bank and other organizations so but I think those two are the most common but I stand to be corrected uh, uh, Juliet and Ine. Um, I don't know whether we necessarily as Rwanda have to abide by those because sometimes they're extremely stringent. Mm. But in line with, with uh, having our own coordination is, my, my, my suggestion would be two-pronged. One, that if we can have our own certification, our own randomized certification. So the same way we have a building code that says access for disabled people and you know all these boxes that you have to tick before getting a, blue, uh, uh, a building permit is the same way you have to start to tick certain boxes of greening your development, whether mm. it is residential, commercial, touristic, whatever it is. And the, the second point is that it should be mandatory. Now, it does not have to be stringent for it to be mandatory because usually that, 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 that's a bit of the problem with with regulation because over-regulation can kill development. That's one thing I wanted to say. But the, 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 the second one is really around, uh, again, related to the development and the lives lost that Juliet uh, 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 spoke about. Sometimes you look at these things and you say, from the time we, 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 we took a very bold, bold step as simple as burning polythene bag, which so many countries have not done. It was in line with saving our environment and all the effects of, of human uh, uh, interface with our environment and that it, Juliet and it was, was a talking about. And it was a homegrown in, initiative. initiative yeah. From that time, which was a more difficult decision than, than getting people to build overnight along a waterway and then that water fails to find where it is supposed to pass and it ends up killing people, you know. So, so the, the whole institutional framework, which has almost become a song here on the square, that is required to, to, to ensure that these negative effects of climate change that Juliet has been talking about, we, we, we do not necessarily need um, um, a foreign entity to come and remind us of some of these things because we, we, we have been a problem of some of the... Of, 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 of the uh, after effects that, uh, that, uh, that uh, we've caused ourselves, yes. So your, your question generally, yeah. if I understood it, and also for uh, it's our really guests... It's a question, it was... Okay, your statement <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is, is basically to see if, um, you know, this certification or standardization, uh, does it always, especially with, uh, you know, this NDC, this uh, new, newly uh, proposed and framed NDC, does it always have to meet international approval processes and so forth and so on. Is that your general uh, Yes, that, that even if we do not necessarily have to succumb to certain global standards, because sometimes they are extremely stringent, mm. uh, but we can do our own and still achieve yeah. uh, the same objectives. That was really my comment. Juliet, yes, do you yes, want yes, to comment yes, on that? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you make a lot of sense, Charles. And uh, I think until we demystify these concepts, that's when they will start making sense to us. Uh, as long as we keep in the definitions, the global definitions, the global, you know, slogans around, it will not occur to us like it's our, we need to work on it. And if we even take a step to work on that towards the certification uh, process you're talking about, uh, we would be doing it like a fashion or kind of, it shouldn't be a fashion, it shouldn't be stylish, it should be a way of life to actually uh, think about um, the resilience aspects, the impacts of whatever you're working on, be it construction, you're clearly into real estate. I, I could <laughs> uh, feel the conversation going, you know, that end. Uh, but it's about all economic activities. Uh, it could be uh, construction, but it could be agriculture as well. Uh, where are you doing the farming that you want to be doing? Which type of farming do you want to do? And uh, 
you know, the list goes on and on. The road networks that we are, we are constructing. How do we construct the, the roads that we are constructing and how do we actually be able to collect all the runoff and deposit it in the right, you know, area that it's supposed to be de deposited? Do we collect it? Do we even think about it? Because uh, I, I think w we need to, I think the point I'm making here, we have to make it a, a way of life, part of the planning process, mm -hmm. part of every implementation of every project, uh, to know that uh, w unfortunately we are living in an area that we, in, a, in an era where we cannot ignore the climate change. And it will not uh, make a lot of, if, if uh, me from the Rwanda Environment Management Authority or the Minister of Environment talks about this, it doesn't make a, a lot of uh, difference. The coordination aspect you're talking about comes into play. We are making uh, some progress, but we need to be faster than we are right now. Uh, we need to see all um, economic activities actually uh, take this not as an add-on, but as part of uh, their daily business planning investment and, yeah. But uh, Diane, if I may add yes, please, to, please, to Charles' ahead. question. Go ahead. Um, so Rwanda actually has a green building minimum compliance system that's been developed by the Rwanda Housing Authority, which sets out the minimum uh, building standard. So it's a building code. It's not actually a benchmark which you strive towards, and you mentioned edge and lead. And, and so forth, but that's more like a, a benchmark where it's really, you know, a, a very green building and of course the standards can be very high and there are also different levels. Uh, for example, in Lee, there's platinum, gold, silver and, and certified level, etc. But in Rwanda, there is a, a national building code that sets out the minimum green building standard for public, large-scale public buildings. So that's there. Uh, now, we, we, of course, Gigi Joe, we've, we've been helping, uh, supporting RHA to develop that, and, and we're now in the process of rolling that out to the professionals who will now be implementing it. So that's there, and that's one thing. I think what, Charles, you're mentioning is more on the certification, the, the benchmark side of things. And uh, here we have the Rwanda Green Building Organization, who, who, who's also in a position to actually set those standards in a Rwandan way. And I think it does not make sense to have a lead uh, system be applied in, in, in Rwanda because these green building standards are very much um, uh, dependent on the landscape, the temperature, the, the typology, etc. So, you know, what applies in the U.S. doesn't necessarily apply in, in Rwanda, and that's, 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 you know, for sure. Just another point is that the building construction sector globally accounts for about 40% of greenhouse gas emissions, so that's quite significant. Mm. Now, in Rwanda, it may be a bit less because there's less use of heating and air conditioning systems, etc., but nevertheless, there will be more existing building stocks that need to be greened and, and uh, energy efficiency measures need to take place. So I think it's a, it's a, great, it's a, it's a great area for us to also um, meet the NDC targets uh, to look at the building and construction, the infrastructure sector, to see how we can green, green that, uh, that sector. And some more, some yes. more good news for us. <laughs> uh, we, uh, through the Rwanda Green Fund, Mm -hmm. uh, we have the green, uh, green city Kigali, mm -hmm. and uh, this is going to be a demonstration mm -hmm. on how construction can be done, um, how we can have a neighborhood that is uh, re climate resilient, low emissions, and then resilient to all this, and basically demonstrate how we can be in a neighborhood in a city uh, that uh, fulfills all these uh, concepts. You know, it's, uh, I think you've ha already heard of uh, this plot in Chininya that has already mm -hmm. been set f out for that. Studies are ongoing, and uh, we just can't wait to see this put up and for us to actually see the random way of uh, defining green urbanization. Uh, Juliet, just before I go to Bernard, because uh, uh, you've been awfully quiet and I uh, would like to hear from you, I think I, I really liked the way you really emphasized the concept of uh, demystifying a lot of the key issues to do with climate change. We need to understand not only uh, as Rwandans but Africans that this is serious. And I think oftentimes, you know, uh, as, as poorer economies, so to speak, uh, we bear the brunt of uh, more powerful economies um, and, and bear the brunt of you know, what these uh, gas house emissions do to, to our environment and, and what have you. And uh, I read a report where across Africa, uh, the youth do not see climate change as a big issue. There are other competing uh, issues such as unemployment and so forth and so on. So 
we really need to work hard in communicating to communities and making people understand uh, this is not a, mystif a mystified uh, concept. Uh, mm -hmm. It is real and it is affecting us. Uh, and it's going to get worse if we don't do something mm -hmm. collectively as soon as possible. Brenna, uh, is there something you'd like to add? Before Brenna yeah. comes, I just had some, a, a light rejoinder on the youth. Yeah. I think the youth admire Donald Trump because even Donald Trump does not <laughs> see climate change as a big issue. Does, he doesn't believe in it. Yes. Okay. Brenna? Uh, no, I, I just wanted to take away the discussion from, from real estate. And, uh, yeah, do you feel Charles monopolized <laughs> yes. the conversation? And, uh, and look at, uh, especially within the African context and the Rwandan context, the impact on agriculture. Um, it would be interesting to know this fund that's, that, that these funds, is it 11 billion? Uh, yes, uh, 11 billion dollars. Yes. yes. What opportunities exist for our private sector? Because sometimes, you know, the buzzwords are there, you know, green city and all these things, green, green. But the reality on the ground is, is, is quite different. And I'll give you an example. As we speak of today, garbage collectors around Kigali City are kind of about to lay their tools down. Why? Because during the lockdown, people were not paying them. They were not receiving their payments. As a result, most of them are being forced to pack their trucks and not collect the garbage. That's number one. Secondly, as of today, we are struggling with the disposal of masks. Wow. Well, okay. Third, as we speak agriculture, if you look at the reports, uh, the outlook uh, produced by the Environment Agency, the projections around uh, declining productivity, agricultural productivity, it includes one of our staples, maize for instance, you know. So I would be interested in understanding, one, the opportunities that exist for the private sector um, around the green initiatives um, and beyond green initiatives, recycling. For a very long time, uh, we've heard about recycling, recycling, but look at the waste management as it is today. It doesn't give so much hope in terms of uh, recycling because the waste still, again, there's not, uh, it's not sorted. When you speak to the garbage collectors, they tell you there's no incentive. You know, if you, they just pick it as is and then to the landfill. Um, thank you very much. And I know we've discussed this on the square uh, before regarding uh, waste management. Uh, amongst other things uh, in, in, in the city of Kigali and, and, and you know, out of Rwanda. So, uh, uh, Rem, uh, sorry, uh, Juliet, if you could <laughs> shed light on that, uh, DG of Remag, if you can shed light on that um, regarding, and also in here, you know, agriculture, private sector uh, interventions in this as well as recycling uh, regarding this latest NDC. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Dana, for raising the private sector aspect uh, uh, on this discussion. Uh, surely, um, if we don't have the private sector with us, I think we are not going to move so far. We are talking about the different economic uh, sectors, agriculture, like you rightly put it. Uh, we need to see investments in this sector. But I think what we are talking about, what type of investments, and uh, your question goes to what opportunities are available for the private sector to join in here. Uh, I think uh, that the, I, I, want to, I want to believe, and I totally believe, that what is important first is the idea to actually um, get convinced that investing in agriculture and uh, investing in agriculture that is resilient to climate change is, is a profitable venture. And, and when we already have this, we are going to actually make progress in coming up with these uh, projects. Uh, I have already talked about the Rwanda, Rwanda's Green Fund, Fonirgua, mm -hmm. popularly known as Fonirgua. Uh, this, was a, this is a fund that was put in place uh, to mobilize climate funds uh, to be able to you know, fund such uh, uh, projects. And this uh, goes to both private sector but also to the public sector. There are, I think we should look at this area of investment, this as one of the investment areas, just like real estates. How do we go to financing institutions to actually acquire funds to come and invest, not just any agriculture, but agriculture which 
uh, has a value addition when it comes to climate change. I think what, what I want to communicate is uh, uh, do we think about the high value crops? Mm. Uh, do we, you talked about the certification uh, mechanism. Do we actually think about uh, going through these schemes, that if, uh, the certifications, to actually have um, produce which is probably labeled eco or organic? I think mm. the word is organic. Do we have organic coffee, for instance? Do we have organic tea, organic honey? Uh, this um, fetches more um, returns compared to, you know, the normal agriculture that we are used to. Uh, and this means I'm going to be conscious about the type of um, fertilizer that I'm using. I'm going to be conscious about any pesticides that I'm using. It starts with the, the idea forming in your mind and knowing the path that you want to take. Uh, we all know how, how uh, costly the organic products are, even on international markets. So I think we want agriculture, we want agriculture, we want the, the food security, but I think we also need some high-end type of agriculture, and that's where the business aspect meets the, the climate-resilient uh, agriculture. That's where the business community uh, intersects with the with environment management. Uh, and, uh, yes. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear from Inghi as well, mm -hmm. maybe yes. even with a focus a bit, uh, if you can, on, on recycling, uh, as Brenna pointed out. Um, so maybe I should just link the recycling bit to this private sector engagement. Yes, I, think, yes. I think private sector participation is absolutely imperative. Um, and uh, the, the $11 billion fund, uh, the funding need is actually, a majority of that has to come actually from the private sector for them to invest uh, in, in green economy and green growth and climate resilient growth. Um, now, you mentioned waste is, is, uh, is a gap currently in, in Rwanda. There is uh, there's some work to be done. Um, but luckily about 70, 80, majority of the waste stream here currently is, is organic. So there's some time. Uh, before, you know, to, to really make use of that organic waste into something more valuable. Um, we talk about this concept called circular economy where we make resource, uh, waste into resources. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of potential here in Rwanda where you can really make use of that organic waste into compost, uh, fertilizer, uh, any other byproducts that you can actually sell and, and make into a business. So, um, the, did you let mention something about uh, you know, venture, uh, venturing into this business, but we need to also demonstrate that it, it makes uh, business sense and there's a business case for uh, converting organic waste into something valuable and uh, value-added product. So I guess that's where we need a bit more demonstration and piloting for, the, for that to happen and then scaling up and replicating throughout, uh, throughout Rwanda to, to make sure that that's a, a viable business where you create jobs, employment, income generation, etc. So I think that's how we can really try and link the waste sector to business, and private sector, mm -hmm. and also waste sector accounts for 12% of uh, Rwanda's uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So again, waste sector can also um, respond to the NDC commitment that Rwanda has put forward. If I may just uh, react to, to the role of the private sector, whether it is in terms of managing waste, its disposal, whether it's what Juliet is referring to, in terms of it having a return in the long run, and what Ini is talking about, uh, that deliberate consciousness. I think there has to be an incentive. There has to be an incentive, and it's just not enough to say, if you go organic, we will breathe better air tomorrow. If you start, mm -hmm. if you drive e-cars, you're reducing. Sp spoken yeah. like no, a true no, no, business no, no. myself. <laughs> there, there has to be an incentive. Yes. And I, I, I'll give practical examples. Today, the government of Rwanda is saying if you are an investor in affordable housing, there are two things that they will do for you, amongst other things. One is that the buyers of your houses will get lower uh, interest rates on their mortgages. Two is that even you as a developer, you will get infrastructure, uh, subsidies, and some tax holidays. So, so, so it, is, it, it is attractive. There is a recovery fund for COVID-19 that the central bank, the, what Bernard was talking about at the beginning of the show, it's for specific sectors and you show how you've been affected and there's an incentive for you to go for that. So I think in the same breath, mm. central bank, 
is probably the one who is best placed, and I hope uh, uh, tomorrow morning Juliet can give uh, Honorable Gwangombo a phone call. <laughs> but if you are going to, for example, reduce the amount of power you're using in your building, and I'm just giving that because the simplest of examples to give, um, by X percentage. If you're reusing your water by X percentage, if you are in the garbage collection and uh, uh, the example he gave of uh, re, you're, you're getting compost and making fertilizer out of that. If uh, the example Juliet gave of uh, organic honey, organic uh, foods, uh, processed foods that we eat or whatever, if, wherever you are in that space, there should be an incentive for you that the money that you're going to get from the bank should be a lot cheaper for you to do that. And then, you know, the, the, you, you, you have a, a, a multiplier effect. That's just my two cents. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, just very quickly before we go to our tweets, because we have some comments uh, uh, for our guests. Yes, Brenda? Just to give another example, um, two weeks ago, I think, two or three weeks ago, we had the campaign again around uh, stopping households from using charcoal. Yes. You know, and mm -hmm. use of gas, for instance. Imagine if it was a private sector led initiative where, for instance, you can get uh, micro loans to buy gas, um, something on your phone, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, pay as you go, or then you can kind of uh, get people interested. But to simply tell people that stop using charcoal, it's not good for the environment. It is not enough incentive, you know. Yet I, there's I, also an opportunity for the private sector. I like that uh, both of you raised the issue about incentives. If I could just have Inghi and Juliet very briefly, be, because we'd love to hear from our viewers, what is your take on uh, in incentivization regarding this N NDC uh, and rolling it out until 2030 to, you know, um, to deal with climate change? Maybe, um, I, can, maybe yes. I can start. Yes, um, please, go uh, ahead. What came, comes to my mind, which is actually implementing other countries, and I'm sure that Rwanda will also pick it up, is green credit. So banks will actually give green credit to maybe energy efficiency in, uh, measures, uh, businesses that are, uh, are, are trying to come up with some green ideas. So they will have a green credit line uh, with a very attractive interest rate to businesses who want to start green business, for example. I think that's a good incentive to, uh, to maybe you know, start things off. Um, maybe did you, Juliet? You can. <laughs> yeah, incentives are really a practical way to go to, to, you know, to take off faster. We already have such an, an initiative in the BRD. Um, mm -hmm. This is a seed money which was, you know, deposited in the uh, BRD, and this is at, around the energy, renewable energy mm -hmm. development. I think the interest rate is so low, around 11%. And that is compared to other financing institutions that, you know, becomes uh, attractive. Um, the Rwanda Green Fund still uh, has um, loans at a very low interest. Uh, in a nutshell, I think incentives are really important for us to, you know, take off faster. Some are already there. I'm inviting people who are in the energy development sector to actually uh, consider um, checking on with the, with the BRD because I know there are funds already that were deposited there by the government of Rwanda to actually, you know, incentivize people in this area of generating uh, renewable energy. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll just quickly read our tweets uh, a few minutes before the show ends. Uh, and we have our first couple of tweets here. I'll read the first one. Uh, the first one is from someone called Elkam who says that we need to act now. There is no planet B. Um, I think this is something that we've been uh, all saying on the show. Uh, we have another tweet from Aimee, uh, and Aimee's tweet states that, uh, if we can have it on our screens very quickly, please. Aimee's tweet says that, hi, whatever it may take, I believe greening Rwanda is possible. Look at our terraces on our beautiful hills. Rwanda did a lot. So this is someone already commenting on, on the landscape um, mm -hmm. that we currently have in, in, this, in the country. Uh, we have another tweet from uh, Innocent, and Innocent states that, um, Charles Haber's concerns about rapid urbanization in Rwanda can be addressed by adopting green cities principles 
uh, which take into account efficient resources use and low carbon emission urban development. There are many good green city examples around the world. Uh, thank you, uh, Innocent, and uh, I think this is something that we already spoke about, uh, the green cities like Juliet mentioned. We have a, a tweet from Janet who says that Rwanda is not immune to climate change impacts, and we're already facing some, some. For example, she says recent floods. We need to play our part as a country to reduce emissions from all our economic activities. It's a responsibility for everyone and not just one institution. Um, I know we have a couple of more tweets. Uh, I think we saw a tweet from Romeo. Uh, but before we go to that, uh, Charles, Werner, is there something you'd like to add on what uh, our guests, uh, our tweets, uh, tweets have said? Yeah, just to comment on, 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 on uh, Janet's uh, observation that uh, the environment is everybody's responsibility. I think we are yet to see campaigns uh, mm -hmm. that really try to send that message that, look, uh, keeping the environment uh, safe, doing everything you can within your space is, is so important. Right now, the, folk, the campaign is still around, you know, you see Rema and it's Rema, <laughs> you know, but uh, the messaging has to change and take it down to actually let people understand that this is something that affects them today and tomorrow and, you know, and the generations to come. So the decision you make today in whatever space you're in, you shouldn't be thinking of how does it affect the environment? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, our last tweet for today, and uh, it's, it's addressed, uh, I'll allow our guests to answer it, is from Romy, who says that, uh, isn't there too much duplication of climate-related entities in Rwanda? We have REMA, we have Rwanda Green Fra Fund, we have oh. GGI, GGGI, <laughs> we have Fonerwa. Uh, so <laughs> I, 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 I realize that there are we have the Ministry <laughs> of Environment. Uh, so over to you, uh, Juliet and... Uh, and Inki, to answer this question regarding duplication of uh, environment, uh, climate change entities in Rwanda. How does it work? Uh, thank you, Dan, and thank you for the, the listener who, who sent that mm -hmm. observation. Um, far from what he thinks, actually, I think uh, each institution has uh, specific attributions. We have, uh, if I could run through very fast, we have the ministry, and that is the uh, a policy and law, you know, it's on a policy level, development of policy and strategy. And then uh, the REMA, for instance, uh, does the actual implementation of the, of the policy that has been, and strategy that has been developed by the ministry uh, and enforces the laws that have been passed by the ministry. And uh, the Rwanda, Fonerwa and the Rwanda Green Fund is one word, is one institution. Okay. Fonerwa is uh, a French acronym and uh, the Rwanda Green Fund is the English one. Thank I think you. we need, we also have the Rwanda, it's Rwanda <laughs> name, but not the acronym. So uh, that, as I already alluded to, is uh, in charge of mobilizing climate resources, climate funds, to be able to, you know, fund, incentivize the different initiatives and projects uh, to actually implement the green and uh, my colleague in here mm -hmm. can talk more about <laughs> GGI, yeah. but... Uh, they have money, that's what I had. Inki, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, just very quickly, I'd like to read uh, two more tweets uh, that from our viewers. Um, and I'm really glad that people are viewing and, and also chipping in and understanding the importance of this topic. And, and thanks again once uh, again to you, Inghi and Juliet, for coming to this show. Uh, we have one, uh, if I can read the two last tweets, we have one tweet from uh, Ud, and Ud says that... Um, Charles Hopper's comments are important to note and should be looked at. We have minimum compliance for green building in Rwanda, but there seems to be no, not much of incentive to accompany them. Um, I think this is something Inghi mentioned, and uh, you know we can delve into it um, uh, again. Uh, we also have another tweet uh, is from uh, uh, Hevendino, and uh, he says, the great thing about Rwanda is a collective effort to find solutions to her problems. First, implementation of gas power in our homes has to boost the climate, and so we have challenged other problems. Uh, the issue of climate can fail us. Uh, before we come to the end of the show, I would like to just uh, hear closing remarks from our guests very briefly. Uh, Inghi, and I'll start with you. Mm -hmm. 
So just uh, maybe briefly talk about GGGI. We're actually in the business of uh, supporting REMA, supporting the Ministry of Environment, actually supporting the government of Rwanda and the Rwandan uh, community to, to achieve climate resilience, to achieve climate adaptation, uh, and to, you know, to be on the road of NDC implementation. So we're actually here in, in a supporting role uh, to make sure that uh, uh, those things are in place, um, being a tr trusted advisor to, to the government and also helping to raise resources to to um, respond to, to the urgent need of greening, uh, greening Rwanda. So that's what I wanted to briefly add. And uh, I think Rwanda is a, is a terrific example uh, in Africa and actually around the world and how committed the government is and how so um, interested and engaged the community uh, in general. So I think it's, it's a really a privilege uh, for GGI to be serving uh, the, the Rwanda in, in this area. And uh, it's been a great, uh, discussion as well today just to hear from, from, the, from the general public uh, through the tweets on uh, their interest and their uh, love for, for the Rwandan landscape and the Rwanda uh, environment. So maybe I could just Thank stop you. there. Thank you, Inghi. Uh, Juliet, very brief closing remarks. Uh, thank you. I want to close by saying that we need everyone's participation, just like one viewer already mentioned. Uh, it starts with me and you and uh, Everyone means institutions, everyone in, means everyone that, uh, you know, is trying to do something. We don't have another planet, like another viewer said again. So it's about uh, concerted efforts, it's about collaboration, but it's about mm -hmm. being committed and dedicated to make a difference, to develop in a way that is not going to impact the environment, and also to know that even if it, we don't take this path, we shall be forced to take this path because uh, that's what uh, uh, the impacts of climate change are all about. They're showing us that if we don't change, change will make us change. Absolutely. Thank you very much to our guests. Thank you very much for joining us, Inghi and uh, Juliet. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, and I'm very happy to see the comments that are coming in. We'll definitely keep the conversation going on social media even after the show. Charles, great to have you on the show. Uh, great interventions. Uh -huh. Great interventions. Nice. Brenna, always great to have you two on the show. So viewers, thank you for watching and viewing. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity, as always, to thank our partners, Uzi Collections and Bourbon Coffee. Uh, have a great night. Uh, keep the conversation going use, using hashtag the Square RW, as you can see on your screens. Uh, be sure to look for us on YouTube, uh, the Square Rwanda on YouTube, in case you can't find the show on RBA. There's an online channel with all the videos to date. Thank you for tuning in. Have a good night and see you again next week.